All right. The disciples renewal. So our uh, <clears throat> our meditation this morning of the Forest Valley Vision is open to our renewal. So if someone would care to read it, we will discuss this for a few moments. Okay. Oh my savior, help me. I am slow to learn, so prone to forget, so weak to climb. I am in the foothills, and I should be on the heights. I am pained by my graceless heart, my prayerless days, my poverty of love, my sloth in the heavenly race, my sullied conscience, my wasted hours, my unspent opportunities. I am blind while light shines around me. Take the scales from my eyes, grind the dust, the evil heart of unbelief. Make it my chiefest joy to study thee, meditate on thee, gaze on thee, sit like Mary at thy feet, lean like joy in thy breast, feel like Peter to thy love, count my fall on things done. <clears throat> Give me increase and progress in the eyes. So that there may be more decision in my character, more vigor in my progress, more elevation in my life, more fervor in my devotion, more constancy in my zeal. As I have a position in the world, keep me from making the world my, my position. May I never seek in the creature, but I but can be found only in the creator. Let my faith cease from seeking thee until it vanishes into sight. Ride forth in me, thou King of kings, the Lord of lords, that I may live victoriously and in victory to take my end. All right. Comments. Saved by grace alone. This is this is this is a regeneration is our sanctification. May all this contain so long. All right, we will convert. I just underlined that it would be plea not to seek in the creature of what the time of the creator. I think that's um, I think that's probably the seminal statement of all meditation. Mm -hmm. We're looking to the world. Anything else? Well, I I like how it ends that I may live victoriously and in victory attain my end. Right. I think a lot of times as Christians we do not think about living the victorious life. We forget that our life is in Christ and He is victorious, and we need to live that way. And we don't we because we let other things overcome us. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is what, that's, that's which is what the whole thing is about. <laughs> yeah, you made me think I'm listening to you there. Christ, you need to uh, live the victory. No matter the condition. Mm -hmm. huh? No matter the condition that we are in. Mm -hmm. You know, all goes back to the point of the force. What the Lord says to without me, you can do. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't want to let the world. Anything else? Make it my chiefest joy to study to like marriage my people call it. Well, we are a work in progress. There's no doubt about that. Alrighty. Well, if there's nothing else, let's try it. Now, today, uh, we're chew biting off a big chunk of steak to chew, right? Romans? Yeah. Yep. I started reviewing my notes on Romans two years ago, and I got all my stuff out and re-typing and reading and stick. I'm, I've just made it to chapter 12 in two years. <laughs> um, well, so. I think James Boyce, how long did he spend on Years to preach on it's virtually inexhaustible. One of the, the gentlemen in, in the seminary I went to said, The Bible is the greatest book ever written, and Romans is the greatest ink ever put on paper in history. So he was a big one. Hmm. And we just thank you. Lord, I know we sound like a broken record here, but I'm grateful for these little meditations. 
uh, they uh, cause us to uh, introspect it. They cause us to look in the at ourselves and see the work that needs to be done for the fact that we're asking. So, Father, bless our uh, teaching today on Romans, Lord, uh, indeed, uh, Paul's greatest uh, letter and greatest epistle. So, we just look that to you, Father. I thank you for it. I thank you for Dr. Sproul leaving this teaching for us. I thank you for Dennis, as I always do, Father. I know he puts work into this. I'm very grateful for it. And uh, so we ask your blessing today, Lord. As uh, And once again, as I always say, that this wouldn't just be a mind intellectual exercise, but this teaching will bear fruit in our lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Good morning, Marlene. Good morning. I see your name. Okay. You're a bit fuzzy on the, uh, on the, uh, on your, audio what did you say hello to you he went he went out the door <laughs> oh, okay um welcome joe thank you glad to have you here <laughs> are you doing a little better uh, day by day yeah pretty much it okay um you know, I, I've been thinking about this, uh, what we want to go to next, and I really think we should do a deep dive into the book. Yeah. Or, and so I've mentioned that Godfrey has has a series on Revelation, and they just they just released one in Romans, both by Godfrey. So uh, those are one of those two. I think we ought to we ought to really take a look at and. And uh, I think uh, I, I just started looking looking at, at the Romans one, um, and but I've gone through the entire one of Revelation. I, I could not keep from watching it. I binged on that series, um, and there's and there's there's about twenty two or twenty three lessons in each one. So again, it's not compared to. Uh, we did a little study in Romans with um, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, I think it was, didn't we do? And, uh, because he, it was on Romans 8, which he calls the best chapter of the best book <laughs> of the Bible. So anyway, um, just be thinking about that. We've got several weeks we have to, have to make a decision on that, but uh, Oh, the other thing I want to mention to you, on November the 2nd, which is a Monday, uh, we're going to be doing a, uh, it'll be a Zoom call or come to the church, and we're going to do uh, a workshop on Breeze and on Connect, oh. and just to be able to get people up to speed, I've had a lot of questions about, about it recently, so we're going to do that, and it'll be like from 7 till Eight or eight thirty. Um, if there's more questions, we can go longer than that. But um, in about an hour, uh, an hour and fifteen minutes. But it'll it'll help people get their profiles so they can access the profile. Uh, how you can email each other use just by clicking. You know, go into the directory, click on their email, and uh, you can email people that way and. Um, like if you have the app phone, you can you can click on on their address, and it'll give you a map on your GPS on your phone for directions. You can if you click on the phone number, it'll call the phone number through your phone. So there's a lot of good things about it. A number of other things that uh, are available that will go over. So anyway, that's going to be coming up on November the second, and uh, if you can't be there and you want to do it by Zoom, I'll have to. I'll have uh, the link for you. So anyway, Romans. Now, <laughs> we just talked about a 23-week uh, session in Romans, and RC's going to cover Romans in about 22 minutes. <laughs> Here he goes. Oh, I have the, uh, I do have this.
We're so lucky that Martin Luther read Romans. <laughs> he gets the verse uh, 17 in chapter 1 and 0. One of the gifts of grace that God has given to his church through the ages is the gift of brilliant theologians, men that God uniquely equipped for their task, men of singular devotion to the truth of, of the Word of God and of a passionate affection for the things of Christ, and also men of prodigious intellectual capability. And I'm thinking of the giants of church history like St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, men of that stripe. Now, obviously, if we would study side by side the works of those five titans of uh, theological acumen, we would be able to discern points here and there with which they differ and have perhaps what we might call mild disagreements. But there is one question that I am sure if we asked of those five theologians whose name I just mentioned, that we would get a completely agreed upon response and without hesitation. And the question that we would ask would be this, who is the greatest theologian of all time? I mean, they would probably fight to answer that question uh, to be first to give the response. And I'm sure that before the question was even finished, Augustine would say, that's easy. It was the Apostle Paul. And they would all concur on that. Of course, Paul worked with one benefit that the others didn't. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But even in terms of his natural capacity and the faculties of brilliance that God gave to this man, uh, he would still have been ranked, I'm sure, as the greatest of the theologians of all time. But Paul was not an ivory tower thinker or scholar. He was also a missionary, a pastor, an evangelist. And when we read that body of literature that has come down to us in the church, we get a taste of the complexities of his ministry. We can sense the pastor's heart. We see his passionate zeal to win people to Christ. And then there are times when he leaves us in amazement at the depth of his understanding of the high things of God. Now, Paul never wrote a systematic theology like the Summa of St. Uh, Thomas or like the Institutes written by Calvin. That is, a systematic theology that was so comprehensive that it might take several volumes of, of hundreds of pages each to complete. But it reminds me of the story, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who once wrote a, a letter to a friend and the letter was 12 pages long. And at the end of those 12 pages, he apologized for the length of this letter. He said, I'm sorry that this letter is so long, but I didn't have the time to write a short one. <laughs> and, and of course, what he was getting at was to be able to say all that is essential to communicate in truth in a short space of time requires a skill and a depth of understanding that is extraordinary. And so if we're going to look for a systematic theology from the pen of the greatest systematic theologian that ever lived, I think we would open our Bibles to the New Testament book of Romans. Because if there is ever an epistle in which the Apostle Paul endeavored to set forth the whole counsel of God in succinct and terse categories, it is in this monumental work that most scholars would agree was the Apostle Paul's magnum opus. And when we think of the book of Romans, we think first of all of the impact that it has had 
in the life of the church. We think, for example, of Augustine himself, who had already distinguished himself as an extraordinarily brilliant philosopher, but had equally distinguished himself as a profligate soul who was living a wild and licentious life until, at the beckoning of children, he picked up a book and just let it fall open, and his eyes came upon a text, and as he read this text, his life was turned upside down as God the Holy Spirit used the words of that text to pierce his soul and transform him to the saint that he became. The book that God used to quicken the soul of Augustine was the book of Romans. We remember John Wesley give, giving his testimony to his powerful conversion experiences. He listened to a sermon at Alder's Gate where during the sermon he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. And the sermon that night was from the book of Romans. When we think of the agonizing struggle of an Augustinian monk in Germany who sought desperately in every corner of the church to find peace and assurance of salvation, something that would soothe his conscience from the assault of the law of God that left him, as it were, hanging suspended by his own testimony over the pit of hell, that this scholar one evening in the tower was preparing lectures and as he was doing research into the lectures that he would give on the morrow, he came to a, an illumined understanding of the Word of God that would change the course of his life and the course of all church history. When Martin Luther came to a fresh understanding of the book of Romans, he said, when I understood this text, he said, the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. It was the book of Romans that awakened Luther to the doctrine of justification by faith alone and persuaded him that this was the article upon which the church stands or falls. As a result of that experience, the book of Romans became the central point of theological controversy in the 16th century and became known as the Book of the Reformation. Now, in the Book of Romans, the Apostle Paul gives us his most careful exposition of the gospel itself. The thematic statement of the whole epistle is found in the first chapter when Paul talks about his own conviction of being a debtor both to the Jew and to the Greek, to the learned and to the unlearned, that he had this, that he had this mission to proclaim the gospel to everyone, for in the gospel, which he said was the power of God unto salvation, is revealed the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Not that righteousness by which God Himself is internally just and perfect, but that righteousness that is now being made available to those who lack their own righteousness, the righteousness that comes to us as the gift of God as it is given to us from Christ Himself. And the Apostle says, quoting Habakkuk, for the just shall live by faith. And that's the central motif of Romans. And that was Paul's passion to explain the gospel and the gospel of justification by faith alone to all who were in Rome and to all who would read this work down through the ages. But Paul begins that great exposition by talking about why the gospel is good news why it is essential for us to gain a righteousness not from ourselves but from one who is perfect in every respect. And he begins by setting the foundation for understanding the gospel by first of all establishing the universality of our guilt.
Before a person can rejoice about the good news, they have to first hear the bad news. And the bad news that Paul declares is that every single one of us, by nature, is exposed to the law of God and to His supreme justice and holiness, and that before His tribunal, we have all been gathered, all humanity, both Jew and Greek, and have been found to be guilty before God. The reason why justification by faith is good news is because it's the only possible way an unjust person can ever survive the just judgment of God. And so Paul says that this universality of guilt is seen in a couple of ways. First of all, he explains in the very first chapter of Romans that God has revealed Himself in the created order to all human beings, so that no person can ever stand before God on the judgment day and say, I didn't know that you exist. Paul argues that God has revealed Himself manifestly, clearly, and continuously in such clear terms that everybody gets the message. But the universal response of the human race to this clear theater of glorious revelation that is found in nature is to suppress that knowledge, to stifle it, and then change it or corrupt it into some form of idolatry by which it is our tendency to serve and worship the creature rather than the Creator. And then in addition to that revelation, Paul then speaks of an internal knowledge of God by which we uh, all are again adjudged to be guilty, because not only has God manifested His eternal power and deity through the, the external nature, that glorious theater in which we walk every day, but He has also visited His people internally by planting His law on their hearts, that every human being has a conscience and every human being has some basic fundamental understanding of the difference between right and wrong. And then Paul looks at the Jews who, in addition to conscience, in addition to this immediate internal revelation that God gives, they also had the supreme benefit of the written Scriptures, the very oracles of God. But even having the law of God spelled out, written in stone, and then on parchment in the sacred Scriptures did not deter human beings from sin. And so, having done this, Paul then argues that every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God, the Jew and the Greek. No one has satisfied the absolute demands of God's perfect righteousness as expressed in His law. And so that leaves us on the rim of despair when He tells us that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But there is the apostolic however. But now, He says, okay, now, the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law. It is that righteousness which is by faith to all who believe, to all who put their trust in Christ, that those who put their trust in Christ receive the very righteousness of Christ as God declares it to their account. And then he develops this concept, pointing to the Old Testament patriarch Abraham as the supreme example of one who was declared to be just, even when as yet in and of himself he had no righteousness of his own of which to boast. And what we're getting at here early on in Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5 is the supreme manifestation of the grace of God as He gives the gift of faith to His people. And once a person is justified by God, the Apostle then declares that we have peace with God and now access 
into his very presence. And from there, he then shows what happens as a result of the person's transformation, of the person's coming to faith and being justified, that immediately, necessarily, and consequently, upon the receiving of faith and the benefits of justification, the Christian pilgrimage of sanctification begins. I remember Luther's phrase, simuliosus et peccator, that the Christian is at the same time just and sinner. The good news is that God doesn't wait for us to be perfected, to be completely sanctified before we are acceptable to Him, but rather we are made acceptable to the Father by virtue of our relationship to the Son by faith. But this is this kind of faith that justifies is never a faith that remains alone, that any person who has saving faith is a changed person. And that person begins immediately the lifelong process of being brought into conformity to Christ, which we call sanctification, that Paul develops in chapter 6 and in chapter 7 talks about the war, the struggle that goes on and on throughout the Christian life that some have called the militant Christiana, the Christian battle, the Christian struggle by which we seek to put to death the works of the flesh and grow in our manifestation of the work of the Spirit. In chapter 8, he gives us the glorious assurance of the providential care of God in which he tells us that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. And now he introduces another one of the grand themes that was recovered in the Reformation, the theme of the sovereignty of divine grace. And he begins three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, talking about his concern for his kinsmen according to the flesh, Israel, and talks about their original election and how God's purposes in election may be dramatized in the examples that are shown in the Old Testament in the difference between Jacob and Esau. And he talks about how Jacob's inclusion in the kingdom of God was not based on any merit found in Jacob, but was based solely and totally on the grace of God that worked in his redemption. And Paul, of course, then quotes Moses and reminding the Romans that God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy, that it is the divine prerogative to grant or to withhold his own grace and mercy according to the good pleasure of his own will. And that very deep and perplexing concept of God's sovereign election is then showed forth as Paul then emphatically declares that we see in it that it is not of him who runs or of him who wills, but it is of God. That's the theme therein, that salvation is of the Lord that it is the Lord's doing. And Paul at times in the book of Romans seems to be unable to contain his own joy and his own sense of praise as he breaks forth into doxology, which is the appropriate response to our understanding of the sovereignty of divine grace. Oh, the depths and the riches of the mercies of God. And he sings his own doxology at that point. In chapter 10, the apostle speaks about the way in which the proclamation of the gospel through human agents, through the preacher, is the means by which God has chosen to save the world. And he has given us the unspeakable privilege of being participants in his redemptive mission. Not that he needs us or depends upon us, but he condescends to use us as 
his earthly instruments by which the word of grace is proclaimed to a dying world. In chapter 11, he raises the question, well, what happens to Israel? Now the gospel is moving to the Gentiles. And what about the basic tree that was the root of it all? Has God cast away his people forever and simply grafted on those of us who are Gentiles as the wild olive branches or, or, or olive shoots and so on? And then he talks the, about the future work of God in behalf of his kinsmen according to the flesh. And so the first 11 chapters are this amazing mini systematic theology it is an amazing systematic theology that Paul brings all the grand subjects of the atonement of Christ, the work of Christ, the original sin, all of these points are expounded therein. And in chapter 12 then, as any good theologian should, Paul then turns his attention to the practical application of our understanding of the truths of God whereby he calls us to lives of nonconformity to this world and of conformity to the things of God, and that that comes by transformation, and the transformation comes through the renewing of our minds. Then practical exhortations for godly living to pray without ceasing and to manifest charity towards one another as we are a redeemed community of forgiven sinners. And no two people in the church are at the same point in their process or pilgrimage of sanctification. And then Paul talks about how we are to relate to one another, and he speaks about how we are to relate to the civil magistrates, gives the, the classic explanation for the very foundation of human government in chapter 13. And then he comes to the end of his epistle, and as typical of the apostle, gives his personal greetings to those whom he has heard of or who know, whom he knows who are at Rome. And the pastoral touch of the apostle becomes clear. The book of Romans is simple enough for a child to understand its basic message, and yet deep enough to keep the greatest minds of the Christian church busily engaged for a lifetime. The older you get, the more stuff you drop. <laughs> <laughs> and the harder it is to get it. Yeah, right. yeah, so right. just play a little bit. Yeah, that's like the, the one story that you see every now and then is when you uh, when you uh, get down on the floor, you have to have a plan on how to get up. <laughs> 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 it's a few. Well, any reactions? He was such an all accepted. I mean, wow, the way that man speaks. Mm -hmm. He's understanding. It is good news. It is good news. Yeah. Um, and it's all free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, we talk about, we were saying, we talked a lot about um, uh, justification, but what are the, I mean, uh, sanctification in this series. So far. But one of the three things that we talk about, there's a formula. Do you, do you recall what it is? It's justification is the first one. Sanctification. Thank you. Wait. <laughs> 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 And sanctification. You heard a voice. Statue Lord? No, it's more me. <laughs> and what's the third one? Glorification. The three stages of a Christian's journey. Yes. Oh, you, need, so, you need new markers. <laughs> so this, this is a one-time event. Okay. This is 
a lifetime. It's a lifetime. Of being. And then this one is eternal. Dennis, uh, could you uh, tell what you're writing? Okay, justification is a one time event. Sanctification is a lifetime of being perfected, being made perfect. And then glorification is the eternal. So this is the event when you are, 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 are become a believer which is, is justification. Sanctification is working it out in your lifetime. And then glorification is, when does it happen? Or when Jesus, when Jesus returns. Jesus returns. And, and you know, this is, this is really most of what he was talking about here um, is, how, is how the... Uh, how things work specifically, um, we know that this whole thing of justification is really, um, you know, what what Martin Luther turned on. You know, as we know the story of Luther, and I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe on the, uh, our Reformation Sunday we'll just take a little detour and and uh, look at Martin Luther that day. Um, but um, he he. He suffered with his trying to figure out how God could ever love him. And it was so bad that he actually said at times, I hated God because I couldn't get it figured out. And then he read this verse in Romans and it completely changed him. And that's when, when, the, uh, when he realized that uh, you're saved by faith, not by works. I like the quote that he was up to stick and he didn't do this stuff. Who knows? Right. Who knows? This is right. When he went to Rome and he was uh, uh, going up these steps, supposedly these steps are the steps that Christ went up. And uh, people go over there, even now. Sproul was talking about being there and how the people were just lined up like they were going to a ride in Disneyland. You know? Um, and going up there on their knees and saying their rosaries as they went up. And, and Luther, when he got to the top of it, he said something to the effect of, how do we know this is true? Um, what can all people learn from creation according to Romans 1.19? Because what, the, what uh, may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. There shouldn't be law. There has to be an intelligence behind it. Whether you identify as the God of the Bible or whatever, there has to be intelligence behind okay. what you say. Yeah, there, um, there is always something revealed to us somehow. Um, you know, we have the changing of the seasons right now, and everybody wants to try to get somewhere and see the, uh, the changing of the leaves. So we're hoping we're going up into the mountains and taking a train from Bryce City into Tennessee. We're going up in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping we get the leaves just right. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a hoping we're not a week late. But, um, but we want to do that because why? We want to see God's creation because there's something in us that we want to see what? We want to see beauty. You know, one of the things that R.C. talks about uh, in other places is there's a beauty about God that we need to understand. That's how he justifies uh, in his church having um, uh, the stained glass windows and the beauty of the sanctuary that they have. He says, because God is beauty, and we need to celebrate that. And, you know, part of the Reformation, guys, they got rid of it. They got rid of it. And then, and the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, they don't even have as much of a cross in their centuries. They, they don't. Um, I did appreciate that about St. Jimmy's Chapel. It was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was gorgeous. Yeah. And, and, and people would ask them, well, how can you, you know, do that? And 
you know, so it's the fact that God, and, you know, and I'm really, this is really becoming so clear to me now about people being called to certain tasks in their life and everybody, whether they know it or not, is glorifying God. An artist is using his talents, whether those talents, whether they know they're glorifying God, they are glorifying God because they're using what God has placed in this world and their imagination. Now, what they paint or what they draw might be terribly bad, okay? And therefore, they're not doing it in a way that glorifies God. But um, you, you, uh, if you're doing things properly and you're and you realize that you're called, you're going to start doing things. Um, I heard a song, I, I was a teenager when I heard this song. I can't, I can't think of the title of it, but it went through a lot of different types of occupations and how each person needs to do it the best that they can. And it was almost like a song talking about where people are called to be. And I was just thinking about that this morning. I was like, where can I find that? I, I mean, it's a song that I remember from when I was a teenager. And uh, now there was another song, if I were a parking <laughs> you know, I guess you would, but it's the same type of thing, but it's not a love song. Like, but, yeah. Francis Schaefer writes a lot about this on uh, our, our move to human humanism. Mm -hmm. has uh, decayed and rotted our literature, our music, and our art, yeah. which once all existed to glorify God. That was the central yeah. thing. Now it's actually gotten to the point where it's foolish, pathetic. And you can actually, you can, particularly in American literature, you can actually trace the various schools of literature and see how society was and how romanticism influence society and it, romanticism doesn't that sound great <laughs> but it's like what were they romanticizing Schaefer says in the Byzantine era he calls it the Byzantine era God was the center of everything yes and all of our music Bach uh, yeah. and, the, and the Baroque and all of our great art okay and, and the literature of the time were based on the great themes right. of the Bible of God Right. And now we have moved from that era into an era because of the um, enlightenment. We've moved to where humanism is the greatest good. So John and I go all the way to New York City to go to the Met one week and go, we're going to see and look at all the great art. Then they had the modern art, and there's this great big picture, probably the size of that board. All it was was one line drawn right across. <laughs> and the title of it was The Horizon. And I'm saying, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> a first grader's crayons would have more valid hanging in their museum than this stupid piece. But it, that, that said everything. We have stripped God out of it and we have thrown him away. There was, there was a story not too long ago about a, a, <clears throat> a piece of art that was just a banana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a guy came in and actually ate the banana and put the peel back. And they said, well, why did you do that? He said, because I was hungry. And, you know, Jackson Pollock yeah, is a classic yeah. example in Long Island. He threw paint onto yes. the canvas. People paid millions of dollars for this. Yeah. There, there was. <laughs> this there, shows you how yeah. stupid and yeah. ironic we've become. The best one with the modern art is the big, like this canvas, like this with a big red dot in the middle. Called the bullseye, and you're like, yeah, right, okay, good. <laughs> or what's his name? Campbell Soup Can. Yeah. You're gonna buy a picture yeah. of a Campbell yeah. Soup Can. He, he actually has a rich name after him. But I know. But you can see it. it it's for, Shame I'm on. I'm sorry. <laughs> you started. So. Uh, uh. All right. So anyway, there's an innateness <laughs> about us that we know God. There's, it, it, it's instinctive that we know that there's a higher authority of some type. And uh, where, um, but how do all fallen people respond to the general revelation of God? Yeah, we run it. We flee from it. You know, and what the scripture tells us to what flee from the appearance of evil. But what do we do if we're not a believer? We flee from the appearance of good. 
and also they create God as a myth. Right. <clears throat> they don't recognize it as well, they, they, it is a fuzzy kind of thing. They basically created in their own image. However, they think God is, yeah. and then it becomes their idol. When I was teaching Romans, back before I came here, the pastor, a pastor's wife in my class said to me, we were reading another thing about the wrath of God is being revealed. She says, God has no wrath. She says, God is love. And I'm like, I, love I wanted to say to her husband, you went through seminary with a uh, master's degree. Sit down and talk to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Joan was in there. Like, she said, God's not wrath. I'm like, well, this whole thing is useless then, Paul. It's wrong. Let's go bowling. <laughs> really? <laughs> what is God's advice to such people according to Romans uh, 1, 24 to 32? <laughs> Yeah. He gave them over to their foolish nature. Yeah. And the foolishness, the foolishness of man. Um, God, in other places, Paul talks about how um, God looks foolish to man. And yet, um, it's actually very foolish in the way that they look at God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans, uh, that's Romans 1, 16 and 17. The key verses in the first chapter of Romans are 16 and 17. Not to be ashamed of the gospel, knowing that the righteous, the, for it's the power of God to salvation. If the gospel is the power of God towards those who believe, does that limit its effect on the non-Christian? If the gospel is the power of God towards those who believe, does that limit its effect of, its effect on the effects on the non-Christian? Depends on how you define it, because it depends on what you use it. Yeah, I mean, there's no limit. There's no limit in God's power or in the effect of people on people. But He has to work it. But yeah, always do. He has to work it. He has to really work it. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. There, yeah. the effects are the effects are right. for the non-believers. Right. The effects for that is condemnation. Right. Because He has to do the work. Right. We can't do it. How is the gospel? Uh, the power of God in the life of the believer. What does the believer now have? Well, yeah, but they have purpose and they have a plan. Yeah. But what does the what does the verse say the believer has? The power. The power of God. But where? How does that come? What do you have? But what do you have that brings you? It's it's right up there in seventeen. <laughs> It's the righteousness of God okay. in us. And that righteousness is Christ's righteousness, not our own. We don't have any righteousness on our own. Which um, calls it an alien righteousness. Yes, and it's revealed faith to faith. And then the just shall live by faith. So, uh, you know, it's sort of hard to parse this uh, mm. separately, but I think the, the power of the gospel in the life of the believer is Righteousness. That's the seminal truth of the Reformation. Yeah. Make of the list of the gifts we have been given if we have faith in Christ according to Romans 5, 1 to 11. And I think um, maybe you can just look at that. <laughs> That's what we have to look at. Peace. Justification. Peace. Grace. Grace. Perseverance. Hope. Peace. I don't know if I'll write all these. 
Well, justification is first. We've been justified. Right. Then he says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Verse right. 2. Through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations uh, brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, and proven character hope. Oh, we got a food choice. Somebody pick it up in there. Okay. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Yeah, rejoicing. Yeah. Second choice. Yeah. So, John. Mm -hmm. One to eleven. Peace, faith, grace, perseverance, hope, yeah. rejoicing, justification. Mm -hmm. All those are gifts that we receive um, through uh, through our relationship with Christ. And again, when we look at the uh, thing that we read from uh, the Valley of Vision, and we think about living that victorious life, why can we live a victorious life? Which one of these words really tells us that we have a victorious life? We're going to persevere. But what does that yeah. mean? The number one, hope. Yeah. Our hope. Because why? Our hope is a definite hope. It's a certain hope. It's not a dreamlike hope. It's not, oh, I hope this happens. It's, I know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And my hope is in the Lord. And it's a, it's a, it's a certain hope. Good point. Um, in verses 20, 12 and, uh, to 21, what was imputed to us in Adam? Sin. And then what was imputed to us in Christ? Righteousness. Righteousness. Mm -hmm. What is the analogy that Paul gives in Romans 11 to explain how the Gentiles became part of the people of God? You're grafted in. You're, uh, so we became part of the people. And, and interestingly enough, Paul sees that and realizes that's his call. Not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. Specifically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What warning does he give them regarding unbelief? He says that if, uh, well, see, he also said that God had caused the hardness to come over the Jews. Mm -hmm. So he said if God can, call, can do that to the Jews, or his chosen children, uh, be careful because you can't say, well, I've been grafted and he can ungraft you just as easy as the Jews. Uh, at least that was my interpretation. No. No. What's your what's your in Christ? You're in Christ. There's no I guess there's no falling away. Once the graft takes in. Well, once you're regenerated. Yeah. Okay, we have so um, we're gonna hold off on this so we can discuss anything else because there's a lot in here. Yeah, I don't know how he does it. Twenty-two minutes, or twenty-three minutes, and he gets so much said. His table is really great. Yeah. But we are uh, we're living in a time where we're not we have no hope. I mean, suicide is. You know, yeah. I just want to tell you, that's a portion of kids. That's a portion of kids. Yeah, I understand, but the statistics are. The, the, the statistics the, are statistics. Okay. Yeah, I understand. And it's just like it's just like when I was working in this in, at Stonewall, I was told there are a million kids in. North Carolina. 25,000 of them go through the juvenile system a year. 400 of those wind up in the facilities like I was working in. There were 100 there. So out of a million, there's uh, uh, 400. That's a very small percentage, but the percentage is rising, and that's a, that's a problem. But it's not as I don't think it's as big a problem as it's painted to be. Well, you can use the statistics, like uh, gunshots of people that die from gunshots are the three men. Uh, 25 of them are self-inflicted. Suicide. 
Yeah. So that, that cuts it off if you're not actually in federal state. Right. So mm -hmm. you can shift statistics. Yeah. Out and what I'm saying is, don't we, help. but we tend we tend to see <clears throat> we tend to hear all these statistics. We hear the stories in the media. But the media exaggerates everything mm -hmm. true that's bad. No, it doesn't well, exaggerate, it lies. Well, mm -hmm. heard, yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It there, lies. There are lies. Yeah. yeah. There are damn lies. And then there's <laughs> statistics. Yeah. Have <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. you heard that before? I never heard well, that. Yes. Yeah. I've never heard that. I think that uh, Will Rogers, I keep saying that. Yeah, you probably I think it's Will Rogers. It probably would be something that, like that. The, uh, what I'm saying is, we do have hope. Well, I understand. And, and it seems like the country doesn't have hope. No, the country is really Well, suffering. yeah, but that's no different than what it was 50 years ago. If you yeah. weren't Christ, you didn't have hope. It was just manifested differently. I know, but I don't know. I, I don't know if the people that are sort of in charge of, you know, like the, the Lord warns us against people that are in charge of the news and the airwaves yeah, yeah. and the radio. Yeah. And to be, you know, to be careful, to be, you know, to watch what you're news. listening to, to, right. to watch what you're seeing. So, but I don't know if they've been such liars no. or perpetrators of liars. No, I don't think they were, but um, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I, mean, I think they might have told place. you half of what was going on, but now they just flat out lie. Yeah. And, and you I, can't, I agree. You just I agree. Can't with you. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's why kids get discouraged mm -hmm. because you got a kid, you got a kid who's in front of the UN telling the kids of the world, "We got 12 years. You know what? Act together. You know what? But you the know kids, what? The kids at Hopewell High School aren't seeing that girl. I know, but I'm just telling okay? you. I'm just that. saying they're not seeing that girl. I know, We're seeing it. Right. It's not just the adults that are seeing. But you know, I think that they they hear that and they say, "Geez, what is she talking about? Why bother going to school if I only have twelve years left of my life?" You know, and I, I think that kind of that message, students are really seeing her. I know, but I still think that that message is out there, and I think they'll hear it wherever they hear it or they see it. I don't, you know, I, like and I, I said, they get I'm discouraged. They get discouraged. Um, I I think they there's there's a lot of reasons that they get discouraged and. And it's it's saying when I was a kid, I got discouraged about stuff. You know, didn't you did you get discouraged when you were thinking about things? I, I, I used to get really discouraged every football practice because of what the coach did. Yeah, but and you never gave me a chance. But as a teenager, I didn't have adults out there telling me that, you know, here's the answer. You can take your life, you can change into something different, you can become a snake for all we care. I mean, it's like, you know, they, we didn't have a lot of adults out there telling us that, you know, these are these are some options for right. you instead of, you know, following God or following Christ. I think that was maybe the difference. I think one thing we have today, I think there was a fellow in the 60s that said something correct. Was Marshall McCullough, you remember him? He made the quote, the media is the message. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Back when we were two kids, most of us in here, we had Huntley Brinkley report. Uh, we had that one hour a night. With our new technology, <laughs> the internet, we have 24, 365 news cycles. So something that happened yesterday morning in Israel, by eight o'clock in the morning, it's all over. And we're in where we are swamped with all of this news, and it affects us. And that's why that's what you're saying. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that's why that's, that's why we need to be trained kids <laughs> to be critical thinkers. Right. And yeah. that's where that's where we've fallen down um, is not being critical thinkers. Even adults, I mean, adults are not as critical <clears throat> thinkers as they should be. But we're not teaching kids, and most of your most of your universities are not teaching critical thinking. And they're not teaching ethics. Either. They're not an open source of ideas. But by the same token, we need to remember that there are um, there are um, uh, the uh, uh, the place there's uh, Hillsdale, there's Geneva College, there's Messiah, there's there's a uh, Grove City, uh, and I'm just telling you the schools that I'm aware of that are teaching critical things. Wheaton, that is Wheaton, um, and and so there's there are schools out there that are Gordon or Conwell, yeah, right. yeah. not so much. Gordon Conwell's gone woke. No, see, there's a problem. 
I know Lamp uses a lot of electric shoes. Well, they're old. They're old. They're old. They're old. They're old. All right. <laughs> all right. Who did Dr. Sproul mention as being the greatest theologian of all time? Well, the Apostle Paul. If he didn't have to be, he said everything he wrote. Well, that's what our sheet says. Yeah, he says he's, he's the only one of them that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other men were to see that they, they, they were illumined. Don't get confused yeah. between illumination and inspiration. Yeah. We're illumined. With Paul, when he wrote, though, those were his words. He right. thought of it. He wasn't right. some mindless oh. machine that just the Holy Spirit I, grabbed his hand right. and wrote. I, you know, but his um, thoughts were inspired. But I don't think. One of the things I don't think is that Paul thought in terms of some of the analogies that he uses, and I use this when I talk about being an ambassador uh, and, and how he talked about that, that he did not think at the time that he was writing that, that he was right. thinking, oh, and in the year 2000, year people after. are going to look at this and say, wow, he wrote that a literary Romans. giant. You know? He wrote that to the Romans. He right. didn't say, I think I'll write a systematic right. theology and so to the Theology right. for the no, he's really right. You know why? Because he wants to go to Spain, yeah. and he wants to introduce himself to the Romans because he needs a little financial support to get that Gibraltar in Spain. <laughs> so anyway, but but so he was writing inspired works. The other folks were being illuminated as he read the scriptures and then prayed uh, through them and, and then uh, put put his thoughts to paper to establish his point that the righteous shall live by faith. Which Old Testament prophet does Paul quote? Habakkuk. Depends on what part of the country you're from. Oh, which country? Or what country? Yeah. So it was Before teaching the gospel, what foundations did Paul lay at the beginning of Romans? Mm -hmm. D. Romans reads like a D. court of law. D. The universality of our guilt. Yeah. Because without that, the rest of it doesn't matter. Right. You can't be saved until yeah. you need to know why. Right. Right. What was significant about the fact that Jesus said Paul's name twice on the road to Damascus? Mm -hmm. He was old. He was horrible with that. And Paul, yeah. It, when you repeat the word jewelry, this shows me where your mind's at. <laughs> no, 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 but we're talking about a word. We're talking about a day. It's Paul, 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 Saul, Saul. Yeah. 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 Jesus knew him intimately. Yeah. But, you know, but Paul didn't know that. When I when I used to get in trouble, my mother would intimately say, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis. Okay. <laughs> in the South, they actually use the, they use the middle name in the actually, South. Actually, yeah. actually, yeah. actually yeah. she would say, Well, let's keep Dennis, well, let's keep Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> they would give him just middle name, yeah. According to Ephesians 3 6, what was the mystery that was hidden for ages and ages? Okay, maybe. Throughout the thing, the Messiah was going to reign. And so, you know. Christ and the Messiah are really interchangeable. Yeah, that wasn't a mystery. That was plain and That's Isaiah. what I'm saying. That was, that was not a mystery. That's scripture. Yeah. And according to um, what is the central theme that Paul discusses in the book of Romans? Yes. <laughs> Who coined the concept of the believer being simultaneously just and a sinner? Um, you know, uh, over a year ago, over a year ago, 
we were we were entertaining a couple at our house that were adopting a, a child, if you recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy had that tattooed on his arm, but in the lap. <laughs> that was just one of many tattoos, and he was talking about another one he was going to get. Won't you get one? Did he read it often? I wonder. I, I, he, he had to. <laughs> what overarching theme does Paul introduce in Romans 8? The providence of God. No, I mean, B is in chapter seven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the federal headship is temporary. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, next week, we're going to cover first and second Corinthians. In 20 minutes. In 20 minutes. And we can do it. Yes. <laughs> Joe, it's good having you. Marlene, I hope you're feeling somewhat better. Uh, it's very slow. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Is today your birthday or was yesterday? It's today, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Nice to be 21, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It sure was. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Romans. We thank you, Lord, for all the stuff that's in it. And we thank you, Lord, that there are people like Marcia that can help unpack it. And we thank you that uh, Martin Luther unpacked one verse in particular that uh, made a change that we are celebrating even this month. So, Lord, we pray that. Uh, you will help us to always keep that in mind as we work our salvation out of fear and trembling on the path of sanctification. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us as we come to worship you today, that you'll be with Steve uh, and uh, Mark as they uh, lead the service, the choirs they sing. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Are you want the speed on what they're doing? Yeah. Well, maybe I don't know. Well, yeah. 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 Y